I'm Peter Robbins. I'm Professor of Physiology at the University of Oxford. I'd like to tell you about a device that we have been developing. Metabolism is absolutely central to life. In order to fuel this process, humans take oxygen up out of the air that we breathe in and excrete the waste product, carbon dioxide. In Oxford, we have been developing a device to measure this process with unparalleled accuracy. There is a reason we've been doing this. Um, there are opportunities to use these measurements in both healthcare and in the pharmaceutical industry. And here, I'd like to look at two of these applications. The first of these is in managing patients in intensive care, and the second is in looking after patients with respiratory disease. So let's turn to Stuart McKechnie, who will tell us about some of the issues that patients face in intensive care. Sepsis is a description given to the body's response to infection. Um, when it becomes dysregulated or abnormal. And that response can be very harmful, causing problems with most of the major organ systems in the body. Okay. Estimates are between 100 and 250,000 people in the United Kingdom every year, with between 40 and 50,000 of those dying. In its most severe form, sepsis is described as septic shock where there is an inability uh, of the body to deliver sufficient oxygen for the cell's requirements. And because of that, the oxygen consumption of the cells typically falls. And that leads to cell damage and then organ damage and ultimately organ failure. If we were able to directly measure oxygen consumption, it's likely we would be, we would be better informed in making decisions weighing the risks and potential benefits of individual treatments to patients. The likelihood is that would lead to fewer unnecessary treatments and hopefully fewer side effects and lower costs. So how can we measure oxygen consumption with the sort of accuracy that would make it useful to doctors working in intensive care? I'd like to turn now to Grant Ritchie to explain the principles behind our device and how it can make these measurements with the required accuracy. I'm Grant Ritchie, Professor of Chemistry at the University of Oxford, and I'd like to explain to you the technical principles behind our device. Our device operates on diode laser absorption spectroscopy. Absorption spectroscopy is inherently a simple technique whereby you simply take a laser and you shine it onto a detector and you monitor the laser intensity. And if there is nothing between the laser and the detector, if you scan the laser frequency, what you will see is a constant intensity in time and wavelength. However, should you breathe into the area between the laser and the detector, and if your laser is at the right wavelength, you will see a change in the intensity on your detector as energy is transferred from the laser beam to the molecules that, that interacts with. You will form an absorption profile. Now everybody knows there's lots and lots of oxygen in our breath, but oxygen molecules do not absorb radiation very well. So their absorption cross-section or probability is very low. In order to make our measurements, we therefore have to compensate by increasing the path length that the radiation and the oxygen molecules interact over. And we do this by using an optical cavity. An optical cavity is two or more high reflectivity mirrors, which allow light to be bounced backwards and forwards many hundreds or thousands of times, thereby taking a small physical path length and amplifying it to have a large optical path length. Now optical cavities don't like turbulence, they don't like humidity, they don't like temperature changes and they don't like pressure changes. All of these things happen when we breathe. Fortunately we've been able to find engineering solutions 
to all of these problems. I'd like to turn now to the second of our topics, that is um, the way our device works in relation to respiratory disease. In respiratory disease, we're not so concerned with the absolute amount of oxygen a patient is consuming or carbon dioxide they're putting out. Rather, what we want to do is use the complex variations in the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that occur as someone breathes in and out to tell us about the pathologies and the disease in a patient's lung. First, however, I'd like to turn to Ian Pavort, who is going to explain to us some of the health issues that are associated with chronic airways disease. Hello, my name's uh, Ian Pavert. I'm the Professor of Respiratory Medicine at the University of Oxford. I'm a clinician and I'm interested in patients with chronic airways disease. And there are two major airways disease that I see, asthma, which is the commonest chronic health problem in the Western world, and COPD, a condition that's projected to be the third com commonest cause of death in adults in the UK. Now, one concern I have is that in contrast to other common chronic health problems, for example, ischemic heart disease, uh, key outcomes have not improved much over the last 10 years in patients with asthma and COPD. And that's despite enormous investment in terms of treatment and investigations. Um, my view is that this poor, uh, this poor progress is because we have inadequate techniques to assess lung function, or one of the key reasons why we're not making good progress. Uh, we're unable to, for example, identify early subclinical disease where targeted intervention with therapeutics or a very focused smoking cessation program might have particularly large effects to prevent the development of uh, more clinically important disease. We also lack techniques to identify changes after key interventions. We have a number of uh, highly specific biological drugs that are um, be, be becoming uh, used to treat severe asthma and certain types of severe asthma. And I think it would be a huge benefit, um, not least for the um, economic and effective use of these drugs, to be able to identify clear evidence of a response relatively early on uh, before huge investment in terms of uh, uh, cost of drugs, but also patient commitment and clinician time. The second issue is for industry in the development of these drugs. They often have to do very large clinical trials with exacerbations as an endpoint. What they really need is an early readout that they can depend on and rely on, giving them a signal that the drug is having a biological effect early, uh, and uh, that being a catalyst for further investment. Well, how does our device which measures gas exchange, actually help with Ian's problem of detecting lung disease early on and measuring small changes in the lung with sensitivity. Well, the key concept here is one of inhomogeneity. To illustrate what I mean by this, I have a collection of spots. If you look at them, you can see they're all different shades of blue but they are homogeneous in the sense that they are all blue. If we want to represent the overall thing in some way, we can take the mean of all the colours and average it down. And we can also look at the range of colours we have going from the lightest blue to the darkest blue. Now, suppose we introduce some inhomogeneity, and we'll do that with a red spot here. If we then go on and average all the colours, you can see that the average colour is hardly changed from where we were before. On the other hand, if we look at the range of colours we now have, the range is much wider, going from red to dark blue. Now, let's turn to the lung and imagine these spots are different regions of the lung. 
in a homogeneous lung, we have a narrow range of colours. But if they, we change the colour of one of these arm bits to show a bit of disease in the lung, we now have a wide range of colours. It's an inhomogeneous lung. And in that sense, you can see that inhomogeneity, in terms of the range of values, um, is giving us an early measure of the presence of disease and a sensitive measure of the presence of the disease because you don't have to have very much of the lung affected. So, to answer my question about why our device gives us a sensitive measure of lung disease, the answer is that by looking at the way the gas comes out of the lung, we can actually measure the degree of inhomogeneity in the lung and by that way detect early change in small parts of the lung. So let's turn now to Naya Patuzzi, who is going to take you through some of the early results we have got using this technique both on normal healthy volunteers and on patients with respiratory disease. My name is Naya Petusi and I'm a clinical lecturer in respiratory medicine at the University of Oxford. We have used this device to make uh, measurements of lung function in healthy individuals and patients with airways diseases. One of the things we um, looked, as, looked at is to see if we can detect changes um, in measurements using our device uh, in response to simple medications and we used salbutamol which is a simple bronchodilator inhaler commonly used in patients with uh, airways diseases and, and these are some of the results. So these are healthy individuals. What you see here is the uh, standard measure of lung function FEV1 before and after salbutamol use. And as you see, there is no change um, uh, seen. On the contrary, using our new measure of lung function, as shown here, at least in three out of four individuals, there's a significant reduction in the measurement. Similarly, what we have here are patients with asthma. And again, FEV1 shows no change post salbutamol. However, using our new measurement uh, of lung inhomogeneity, you can see in two out of four individuals a significant reduction in the number. Anecdotally, this patient here that showed no change in uh, our measurement of lung function reported that he found no benefit of, with salbutamol and therefore he stopped using it. So this suggests that um, measuring lung function using this new device has the potential of being able to detect um, changes in response to drugs that we cannot currently um, detect using conventional uh, lung function. And this has important implications um, as novel drugs um, uh, make our, their way into a clinical practice. So another thing we wanted to look at is whether using this new device and these new measurements of lung function, we are able to detect early changes in the lung signifying early lung damage. What you see here is a group of healthy individuals who are non-smokers and this is the new measure of lung function uh, as measured by a device. And as you see they are clustered together down here. Now this is another group of people that are healthy but who smoke. And as you see, they, 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 they are different in terms of this new um, measurement of lung function. Now, all these individuals are healthy and they have normal lung function uh, as measured using the current uh, uh, available um, lung function techniques such as uh, spirometry, which cannot tell them apart. To put this in context, context, this is a group of COPD patients and the measure of lung function using our new device um, is clusters them up here. So what this suggests is that um, this new device is able to detect subtle early changes caused by smoking which at the moment we're not able to detect using current lung function techniques. Now this can have huge implications. If you're able to detect lung damage caused by smoking early 
uh, and capture it before it becomes irreversible, then there is a potential for um, early intervention. This intervention could be smoking cessation or could be early commencement of therapy aiming to slow down disease progress. Well, we've seen that we have a device that can measure oxygen consumption in intensive care with unprecedented accuracy. We've seen we have a device that can detect disease in the lung early. We have a device that can measure really small changes in lung function with considerable sensitivity. This device presents a real opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry to conduct trials on smaller numbers of patients making the development of drugs faster and cheaper. In terms of patient care, it gives us a way of looking objectively at what a drug does to their lung function. And this is going to be increasingly important to making sure we prescribe in a fair and effective manner and so that we get the right drugs going into the right patients.